Hello everyone, today we talk about the secularist theorists of the empire. In the early 14th century, mainly the, um, the figures of Marcellus of Padua and William of Ockham, under the protection of Ludwig the Bavarian in his struggle against the Avignonese papacy, Recently we made a video about the last theorists of the uh, of universalism, fundamentally. Uh, Aegidius Romanus, Dante Alighieri. And we have observed already there as a broader interpretational pattern, the, of course, th that's the point, you know, the denial, the gradual um, collapse, in a sense, of the um, universalist theory and equally, and this is what is often not um, pointed out, conversely, the rise essentially of a, not much just of a nationally based, kind of um, uh, modernly even based theory of state, but also the individualism that uh, emerged with that, in, in ways that, of course, from a modern perspective, we have been used to praise in as much as, first of all, we tend to read history in a sort of theological sense, and indeed when we come to political theory, we, we, we cannot deny that aside from the, of course, uh, you know, absence of any determinism in historical matters, there was an intentionality in, in the process. But we essentially sympathize, we were used to sympathize with such events, essentially the, the decline of great universal powers per se, and it's important to stress here how also Ludwig the Bavarian, that was Holy Roman Emperor, uh, of, in fact, of an empire that was shrinking, that had already shrunk dramatically in power, and so you know, was embodying, in theory, one of those universal powers, was himself, for, you know, we'll see now political calculations, stressing that, at that point, the, um, the universality of the empire was, was just sanctioned in, in power, but by the the, the, the the princes, right, the consensus of the princes, in that fundamentally the papacy didn't have any influence on that. And so many will cheer because, you know, there is this idea of the papacy having been a sort of exploitative and oppressive system that has uh, rode uh, backwards, uh, you know, compared to, to, to modernity and so on. We're talking about the 14th century, we're talking about a time where definitely those two universal powers, first of all, were not denied as such. When the, the, the theories of Marcellus from Padua and William uh, uh, from Ockham were uh, extremely radical for the time beings and in a sense never actually bowed completely by the whole system at this point, not just because there was a papacy, but of course because properly there was a tradition that was thinking otherwise in general. And that um, sh do show a sort of subjectivistic uh, attitude that fundamentally is very similar to the one that we witness today in, in a very similar fashion at essentially the shrinking of the great powers we were used to think and think about the United States, the emergence of this other essentially regional powers that are not the, you know, the, the, do not even have an aim of being overlords of the world in a sense and that in this regard bring on the four different ideas that if you are not a moral relativist you know essentially all have a different worth and uh, in, in, in universal terms in fact um, cannot be considered as all equal, right, or, or equally valid, or, you know, it's not that they have to be completely wrong, you know, in all ways, there is still, in fact, a deep penetration for what, essentially, the West has fortunately brought on the fore ever since, you know, it, the, the 19th century in a complete fashion, and most of world powers are essentially derived from Western theories. I mean, even when we want to stress the uh, the exotic nature of the, the alien air, pick China. Uh, communism was invented in, in, in Germany, <laughs> that stemmed from, from the West as such. It's not a random, you know, historical communism. No, it's literally the Western models imported in that country made it work in the same way. The same goes from, for India. Think about the, the British influence or Brazil as, you know, a colonized uh, you know, a uh, region in general. So, um, the, this is yet another uh, 
uh, issue. But the point being that, of course, we cannot cut uh, dramatically, of course, even historical changes just by saying, you know, we're, we're looking at, at a matrix that would remain a absolute in nature, of course. But at the same time, we're witnessing worldwide a sort of moral collapse of, of in fact, the forces that had brought up to a few decades ago, normally, to, to consider that, yes, there was kind of a universal goal, that, after all, the world had uh, a meaning, had a sense, had a direction, had an order, had a certain, you know, was controlled by a certain authority, was, that was backed by very specific, you know, specific ethics, based also in a rational, scientific uh, mindset and, you know, system, broadly speaking, and that uh, eventually is being, has been fundamentally substituted by radical subjectivism and individualism and, and also from still from the traditional side in a sense losing touch with what was the sap of that original um, of that original culture that is to say even reason can easily derail in rationalism for that matter or the same uh, reality can can give up to, to, to realism in a sense so there are always challenges that are to be seen and there are new ideas and attitudes that really uh, come to mitigate the same thing um, and so um, Marsilius and 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 uh, Occam let's say were in a sense also bringing on the force something new that was surely accompanying the transitions of times and and are very very understandable in in the specific context we'll see now, but that still fundamentally re rejected the great universal structure that had been built during um, Aristotelianism, Thomism, the, by you know the, the the universal view of the world by the church and also the the main secular authorities that had cooperated uh, in that sense to. To actually create the, the great medieval civilization that we know, the great powers that had up, up to that point had embarked themselves in this great universal project, and that now, because of also structural systems, right, the great contraction of the uh, economy, then the plague would have arrived. Uh, the same, I don't know, probably the same Occam died of, of plague in fourteen, in thirteen forty nine fifty. Um, uh, had contributed, however, to, to make shrink, to make collapse, to make destruct, and, and going in parallel with this, say, reverse uh, reversion to a more individualistic and subjective and, um, in fact, re relativistic ideas, right? Which, again, is extremely similar to what is, is occurring right now, and properly the denial of the the functionality of that superstructure. Now, one can have different ideas relatively to this thing, but there is no doubt that this was a moment of crisis, of shrinking. So, if the ideas adapted to this by, of course, in part necessity, uh, but also convenience in that regard, which often overlap in, in a sense, but um, th 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 this doesn't mean that there was actually a qualitative improvement of what we know as medieval civilization. Medieval civilization contracted brutally before Europe came back to the uh, you know levels properly of, of magnitude of, of the system of, of output of production of mental prolificacy. We have to wait for the 17th, for the 18th century, um, and uh, and so. You know, a massive crisis from which the continent recovered brilliantly, meaning that it, it had the resources definitely to reshape itself from you know from from the the ground, right, from these local powers. And in fact, grew as you know, Europe uh, wouldn't have an overlord. In fact, at that point, up to you know, no power uh, up to Napoleon would manage to essentially to achieve that, even though there were important still uh, expansions throughout. You know, the the Habsburg, Spain, uh, Louis the Fourteenth, France, and all these things. But fundamentally, it was still a game of, of many different powers that were not recognized. Would grow eventually with modernity and modernism, not to recognize a, a, a superior uh, authority, right? An overlordship all over the world. Now, you can argue that, of course, the parallelism I made before compared to, uh, I mean, the twentieth, you know, with say, the twentieth century, the idea. Of, of the world, um, if not dominated by a single power, of course, but still polarized, and that, that's another 
concept that I don't quite like, but I mean, having two thirds of you know gold reserves in, in in your hands at the end of World War II is definitely something that you know e not even in the 13th century uh, or let's say 12th, 13th century Germany or France had objectively the control over Europe, right? So that's not the point. But it, it's about the again the necessity, the idea of thinking yourself uh, improving at the point of having the faculty of of command of of of, an, of the universe entire and and this requires a, a gigantic moral effort that it was translated in many ways even in fact by the same uh, aristotelic um Thomistic, uh system um but properly by the, the the dramatic synthesis capacity that we have seen in in the greatest authors of of universal medieval universalism we made a series about dante for 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 this reason aside from the anniversary of, of his death 700 years 2021 but properly showing how fundamentally the the the, the proclivity to think many in a comprehensive system that fundamentally he has to make sense of as fundamentally it's, it's biblically uh, it's biblically showed and and presented as the the, the duty the task of, of of the world in a positive sense in that kind of truly humanistic direction that is very different in fact from the one that would paradoxically emerge with humanism itself exactly at this point um, invited to that kind of scientific inquiry, to that kind of confidence in yourself, in that, in, in that initiative, right? Even if that offensive capacity, that eventually Europeans, in a sense, will recover as soon as they they had, in fact, the means, even through colonialism, the age of exploration and expansion. So, at that point, trying to make sense again of the world by the 19th century, this, there was this omnicomprehensive you know, uh, and positivism uh, properly meant to, to uh, the idea that after all everything made sense and had to make sense. Maybe at that point it was also the, the excessive realism of rationalism of, of, um, of positivism in itself. But at that point also much of the, um, of the um, omnicomprehensive cultural background that the Middle Ages had produced in thinking the world in universal terms had dawned because the rise of the nation states and the uh, the objective absence of a real overlord right the British Empire was objectively challenged constantly by by the French one were other powers uh, it was it was never like an authority conceived in in our in, in our last centuries as properly the one that had that could make the thing in a sense as I was saying before the Americans embodied this after World War II because also they were called to a task it was quite concretely the one of command right uh, had the Third World War broken up they they had they, they needed to have the the moral and material capacity to cope with that so it was really there was a pressure there was a tension that we can find even in the 13th century in the great uh competitions that we've seen as we've seen uh, also in the recent videos we made about the great powers of the 13th century the swings between uh, you know the orange stuff and the the, the capetians all these things um would would keep awake right today now think about fukuya right and uh, the the general hand of history illusion, right? And we are presented with the fact that this was not the case. In a sense, we habituated ourselves to think that there would be always that that progress, that things would always go well. Uh, since 9/11, we have we have un we have seen quite the hard way, even though that the crisis is perhaps you know almost 10 years before already. You know, the peak of the West is 1991, right? And that and and that that's a that's a year loaded in meanings, both historically and demographically. There are lots of things, but um, we have we have lost, in, in a sense, from a moral point of view, that confidence because we've seen that effectively um, uh, we have traded our understanding of the world in the true effort of making sense for a universal point of view for some kind of okay, it's done, we've made it, right? We have grown fat and rich and so on, and so. What's why should we take responsibility or accountability or why should we improve ourselves? Who cares, right? And so this kind of Dionysian uh, 
uh, almost it, like pleasure based idea, which in a sense is what, as we will see, also the same, the same, the same theorists will put out the separation from between theology and policy, right? The idea that common, let's say that not even common good, but properly, um, the, the 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 immediate good, right? What makes you feel better in a sense was seen as the objective of even in the theory of Marcellus of Padua probably William of Ockham in a sense with his contingentalism almost as if it was a kind of an existentialist um, individualism right quite mad because he recovered uh, you know uh, a nominalism in making every uh, every entity in the world, every person, kind of uh, uh, unique and absolute on its own, and uh, therefore anything outside your own soul could couldn't be known. Didn't have a real sense. You were the only one who decides whether things make sense or not. Does it remain remind you of something? This that is essentially there's no structure out there. Reality we we're not supposed to make it sense in a in an objective fashion. It's all about what you feel, right? So that's why I was saying. Yes, we do see legitimately, especially William of Ockham is indeed, the, I mean, easily the, the the most important philosopher of the 14th century. But in, in that sense, he's also the expression of that decadence of universalism. Uh, it, in spite of he he brought forward many interesting concepts, very modern ones. Very he was that he was smart, right? I'm not saying uh, you know we have to think of him as a demon or something. You know he objectively exposed also the fault of some you know explanations that are Aristotelianism there I don't know even from a strictly physical point of view I don't know he's pointed out something that is physically correct that is the the reason why a projectile flies uh, it's not because of the push of, of, of air on it but it, essentially it's because of a force that it has within itself I mean important acquisitions that of course Europe like it's not that between the 14th century and 15th century was declining. It was reinforcing, but on, on a different base. In a sense, losing track of the of the comprehensive dimension. A bit like our hyperspecialization is, is taking place in our scientific culture today, and so missing the bigger picture and therefore missing the greater purpose that can make one's life fulfilled in, in, in the broader reality. So not from what happens within yourself, right? The interiorization emotionalism these kind of feelings are are expressed even by art right there is a darkening of the atmospheres there is a, a greater sense of insecurity of anxiety 14th century art even before the black death right you know in the triumph of that in itself this sense does it remind you anything of our current times between you know individualism moral relativism fear of of that of a world that we have to entrust somebody else's power to in order to, to fix our own problems well this is exactly what we're living and the more I it's not just because I specialize in the early 14th century but it's probably because I see that 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 there are striking comparisons right between our properly our mentality to even the pandemic to other things of course dramatic differences at the time people really you know that at the time was something much more dramatic for for, for many reasons but in a sense, we're not better, mm, say, suited, d d disposed than those men at the time, because they were at least habituated to much greater struggles and effort. And they, you kind of even un un kind of understand why they gave up, right after in an entire centuries of, of continuous wars, the system basically collapsed from the exhausted itself, right? At this point, we are completely better, but our moral strength is 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 basically nothing in comparison of what they had to regularly go through on a regular basis. But it's also interesting in the evolution of it. Another parallelism is, in, in, is indeed the, let's say, the, the fake kind of humanistic approach, meaning that everybody knows that by the 14th century, 15th century, there wasn't at all an increase of individual freedom. This is another myth that we have being fed with by modernistic interpretation of the Renaissance and all this bullshit that are debunked by any kind of historical standard. That is, of course, humanism was a, a radically elite phenomenon designed exactly to keep actually people down, people under uh, the main curial, the main seigneurial princely powers of the time it was elitistic. In fact, it, it kind of lost track in fact, of, of, of that um, general sense of what the, yes, men had to be, but who were these men? They were just the, the elite, the aristocracy. We'll see even in Marcellus of Padua, yes, the assembly of the people, this almost democratic state base, but it's just an elite, and even states that. 
Um, and so a bit the same things we're fed today, right? If you uh, look at any advertisement today, it's all about you. Yeah, whatever you want to do is fine. It's all about you. You decide what you want to do because you it, it's about your feelings that define yourself the way you are. There is no other person that can define what you are, right? Complete moral relativism, right? Complete denial and rejection of any rational scientific standard in the history of, of human civilization. Uh, but this is done in the name fakely of of you right so the the, the individual the the human so it's a kind of a neo-humanism of some sort except this is all happening in a moment in which just like at the time and in, in, in man, the, the 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 average person is dramatically sinking in in power right in relative terms you know a, a european in or a westerner let's say in in the second half of the 20th century with a vote could objectively make some difference that today is not even remotely conceivable right there are some greater powers essentially have reduced radically uh, in relative terms the power of vote or anything you know that they command right these are the new elites this is the new feudalism this is the new re in fact uh, oligarchization of power that occurred in in late medieval europe again completely in the opposite in the comp diametrically opposite direction of what you have normally been told that the renaissance was about right because again we need the mo the myth of modernism we need to substitute uh we, we we needed civilization in a sense to to create an alibi a justification a, uh, an alternative to having killed uh the great uh ambition of universalism Right, it, we, we needed to create another myth that unfortunately doesn't stand on its feet because as, lo as long as that kind of material drive is satisfied, you don't have a moral background, backbone that, that can't make you stand up by yourself. And that's why we are so incredibly weak today, right? Because literally we could do everything, but we have no purpose. And therefore we feel depressed and therefore we don't know what to do. And, uh, and, and we take refuge in, in radical subjectivism because at that point, we, we're not habituated properly even to make the effort to conceive something so so grandiose like a universal theory and interpretation. Uh, in any case, to go straight to, to history after this, this um, you know, preaching press, <laughs> like, you know, uh, I could be a perfect, um, you know, papal supporter of the, <laughs> of the, of the early 14th century. But uh, jokes aside, there were reasons, of course, why this was was happening. But as you know, I'm, I'm kind of a fan of a, any kind of rational, uh, scientific, com comprehensive, universally uh, oriented system and its authority and its order, its discipline. So somebody who has, you know, uh, I believe that the irreplaceable essence of civilization is, of course, realizing that in your fault, you have always to learn from some standards that lay outside of you, right? That there is an objective truth out there and that you're tasked to search for it because the more you do it and the more you can improve yourself, right? And you are the, the agent here. You are the actor. You are the one to which the crea creation has been entrusted in order to be figured out, in order to be managed, in order to be controlled. This is Genesis, right and uh if you abandon that you fundamentally lack um at, th at that point any kind of other possible standard because you don't base yourself on the experience uh much per itself which is interesting because william of Ockham, as you know was fundamentally an em an empress right but he denied the possibility of understanding um uh, let's say of defining reality in a way that went beyond, in a sense, the senses of what you could experience in, uh, in, uh, in fact, for, in a physical sense. The problem is political. That is to say, what can we achieve um, individually in this sense if we don't order this knowledge, this information in, in some standards that can lead us orientatively to what we have collect also comprehensively observed to be kind of a broader standard. Knowing reality brings you to make sense in that. The great rationalist, the, the peak in a sense of human thinking, uh, between you know the, the, the end of the, the 18th, the, the, the early 19th century, was stressing exactly that, that it's paradoxically from the difficulty of knowledge, 
and the, the difficulty of learning and of the of, of actually bringing information that paradoxically we um, we learn the an axiomatic view of the world right so uh, what, what it means by the third and the 14th century is that what before was also afforded in the in this uh, affordable in in by the universal powers as such properly from from a strictly even the resources that were put at disposal for these for this broader effort was in a sense cut right at the moment which these powers collapsed and the the the, the smaller ones in a sense were coping with other problems that didn't need to think of reality in a broader sense but again this came through a moment of contraction of of crisis of collapse so again what is happening today is it could be countered by still recovering the idea that yes there are objective standards that independent from what you think or feel think to discover you will exactly because of the difficulties that you have that you have to realize you will always fail if you just base your you know the, the your 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 view on on what you uh, only you believe or feel or, or whatever right so um there is always a, um a point must be always a point of reference that you can't confrontate with not much because that has to be necessarily right all the time you're wrong but because if you don't conceive yourself in relation to to the outer side in the others right you cannot fundamentally improve yourself by yourself and this stands at the roots of so many different philosophies, including Christianity, of course, uh, as a religion, but properly of, of a scientific realization that without that um, that daring, that let's say that possibility of of accepting that civilization has all uh, has already come to points that you still have to learn as an individual because you can't be superior individually to civilization itself who are you to, to believe that and how much that that pride and arrogance would, would lead you to if if we just leave standards just up to you right so there is always a civilizational value in the idea of, of an authority and an order that remains um, there to sometimes even just in a purely coercive fashion right not just in a in a let's say a persuasive way Right, and this is in fact this os observation is still contained, for example, in the defense of Pages of Marcellus of Padua, because um, the, the necessity the, these were these theorists were not just anti-universalists. Right? They were theorists of the um, of the s secular nature of the empire. Right, um, Marcellus was still in the sense of in the full kind of Roman secular tradition, the idea that the emperor had to rule everything. Right, William was a bit different than this. There, there's a bit more of common, you know, English common um, sense of equity, for example, that said, you know, but yeah, the, the, the emperor is also to be subjected to, to, to the good of the people, right? Which, which also, in a sense, is fair because common law was at the base, basically, of any other theory at the time. Uh, I mean, juridical practice, factually, and this was also already a a concept a thing in fact actually m most of what was said of uh think about even the the secular preeminence of the empire the idea that the empire is there as a secular authority as an, a universal one so the church should be just a spiritual one uh this is not a new concept right this is just a concept that looks finally at the fact that the church was shrinking in power and therefore couldn't quite ask for too much and therefore the coming back of the of the lay perspective was stressing the the most the utmost consequences of this i mean in the byzantine empire the church had always been subjected to to the emperor right that's the reason part way roman law was also recovered at least weaponized in the, in the sense of this but because because in, in, in the roman empire that had always been the case what had happened in, in western europe during the middle ages after the gregorian reforms was something else but yet um the idea of a dialogue between the two universal authorities the idea of not having a single pole right but two ones that dialogue between each other was an, an enormous source of civilization i mean you wonder why the byzantine empire eventually collapsed within itself um 
well, that came in the moment in which everything was not challenged anymore from a moral point of view, because the order was set in which everything would have never changed it. This is an obtuse idea, right? The, 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 con the investor controversy between the struggle between the papacy and the empire had, has produced in the West s some of the most radically powerful uh, civilizational outputs in the history of mankind. In terms of recovery of, of you know of legal studies of properly the, the same political theory, was there, there there were immense wars that were fought all throughout this century that have literally molded some of the most successful polities, if not all in Europe, that that eventually would emerge during during the Renaissance, the, the modern age, and all the culture that surrounded them. So. In fact, it's very interesting to look here also at the, the players because we're talking essentially about, you know, uh, at this point a, a French uh, papacy almost, definitely, um, an Oxford uh, scholar, uh, an Italian scholar, and a German emperor, right? So here we have properly the the magic tetrarch, let's say, of of the West in, in its... Uh, in its entirety, and the relations that were established between uh, these ones are uh, uh, also fascinating for how deeply Europe had at this point been, you know, con interconnected between a place and another. So, what? The, why are we talking about Ludwig of Wittelsbach, Ludwig uh, the Fourth Holy Roman Emperor of Bavaria? Because uh, he was the essentially the first Germanic ruler to state that effectively the election of the king of Germany, of the Romans, and uh, of Holy Roman Emperor could effectively occur without the the consensus of the papacy, but exclusively of of the princes, right? So as the Germanic empires, you know, as we've seen countless times, had contracted, had fundamentally lost that universal. Um, power uh, in ambition, at least, but properly military capacity to to intervene in, in effectively in a grand scale in the Mediterranean. Uh, Ludwig was, in a sense, one of the last emperors that actually launched a military expedition for that for that purpose, and still always declined. The, the picture here after the interregnum is Henry the Seventh was a hell of an expedition. Then Ludwig the Bavarian. A so so one, and then Charles of Bohemia it was, yeah, kind of uh, something much more, you know, much less definable in some ways, uh, in the first half of the 14th century, and and the and the picture is of course the one of a shrinking empire that, given that had traditionally maintained its um, prerogatives in within the German kingdom. Uh, and beyond, I mean, north of the Alps, let's say, let's say in Central Europe, counting Bohemia, etc. Um, of course, was stressing now a bit more of a national character than before, right? The Holy Roman Empire was before just Roman Empire, then it was called Holy Roman Empire, then the Holy Roman Empire of the Germanic nation. Why? Because, of course, uh, it, it had become evident that rather than, than a Holy Roman Empire was fundamentally a Germanic empire and, and, and something that didn't quite look much of as an empire anymore by this point. Um, so, of course, there was a need of nationalization of policy. We made a video last year and we've discussed these things again about properly how the rise of, of what tends the modern nations objectively began. Um, for obvious reasons, right? Universalism doesn't mean that nations didn't exist uh, it's dangerous, of course, to make conne nationalist connections with that, meaning that, of course, what rose with the nation-state we believe today is something radically different what what, what a the actual nation at the time was. And we are, have arrived at the point that people don't even understand the difference because they, they just are obsessed by, tra by tracing the connection with the, 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 the ethnic continuity, and that's basically what it's come to. While even just the concept of nation is something more 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 complex by itself, politically speaking, but in, in any case, uh, this had been seen already in France. That had essentially played here the part of the of the empire um, in the in the later decades. It had happened with Philip the Fourth that reached the acme of medieval France fundamentally, 
albeit still in a containing fashion, uh, and gradually with even the crisis kicking in after the big rise, the the, the building, the development of of the of the 13th century. Um, and it's paradoxical, but not so much. And this is also another interesting civilizational lesson that Philip IV, as a monarch, what we were saying before, that France had been structured like one, one power that was kind of unitary in nature at this point, in spite of, of course, not in a strictly statal sense, because it was still a sum of possessions, but had a single head, right? That's something that does stem in part uh, the flourishing of, of ideas or that kind of uh, um, mental, uh, say, variety and, and flourishing and diversity that is still necessary for a civilization to happen. So that's why the plurality of universal powers also is important. And in fact, in spite of the, um, uh, the, the, the great thinkers such as uh, Pierre de Bois uh, and uh, Philippe de Nogaret, that were, you know, original and interesting intellectuals at the French court and experts of law, of politics, and so on. Um, the the emperor, as a much less powerful ruler, still could uh, benefit of two of these two great masters, Marcellus of Padua and William of Ockham. William of Ockham was not even a subject of the empire, even though, in theory, the empire could even exceed the kind of uh, German-Italian borders as well. And in any case, was an attractive force. Why do I say this? Because let's look at Marsilius, 1275-1342. Right, he was a philosopher and scholar of uh, Padua, uh, who had taught at the University of the Sorbonne, right? So this was the best of the West, in a sense, um, the top juridical and theological studies, right? Uh, Padua and, and, and Paris, um, where, in fact, he had received uh, a by, by Pope John the Twenty Second, who was also one of the great, really powerful popes and a very political one, right, almost sacred, considering all the wars, in fact, against the same Ludovic the Bavarian, against the, the Visconti Lombardy, and so on, spending millions of florins for single campaigns, had received a, a canon office by him, by, by the Pope. So this is all the more interesting, because you realize that Marsilius was born as, a, as, a, as an intellectual and as an expert, as a, as a scholar, from within the most Guelph tradition, the most philopapal one. But in 1324, he composed, together to his um, helper, uh, Jean de Jandin, that uh, he had met when he went to study in Paris, that become friends and associate, um, a treaty of political theory, the Defensor Pages, which, as you understand, it means the Defender of Peace dedicated originally to law, in, in general, in the important of, uh, the, you know, the juridical theories and so on. And this work, instead, provoked such a scandal to oblige Marcellus to escape to Louis the Fort, that he, uh, to Nuremberg, that he went with Jean de Jantin, um, uh, and, uh, and Eventually, he, he was a protege of, 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 of the Wittelsbach, and he eventually even accompanied him in the Romfach in, 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 in Italy in 1327, 1328. Right? That expedition was quite interesting because um, you, you know that um, Henry VII had made this enormous um, campaign in Italy. He had managed to compact the Ghibellines in the north, uh, it's interesting in this regard that Marcellus also came from, from a city like Padua that had been deeply affected and disrupted exactly in those years by the, actually by the, 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 the Ghibelline offensive. Here, Padua was being essentially controlled by the Habsburgs, the, the imperial vicaries, German mercenaries sent by uh, 
by Austria while the Vittals back in Bavaria were kind of opposed to them. And um, while Ludwig was much... so, it, And Henry VII still was a bit more imitative of Philip IV, right? This hierarchical, almost um, hypostatic figure of, of, of the ruler that doesn't never compose himself this is always very stern and you know almost saint like right ludwig passes a as a very you know uh, you know lusty happy you know joyful man right and also a capable ruler objectively that was in fact probably the best among the the the, the, the ruler the, the germanic uh rulers of the time considering that he went to italy to a very specific purpose to take the imperial crown and he cashed basically <laughs> he you know um blackmailed all the, the italian city states including the allies one that had hosted him right in this forever struggle between guelphs and ghibellines kidnapping the the visconti in, in milan um and you know doing the same with with peace that were as we will see he will be reached by william of Ockham there um and uh coming to rome getting the crown devastating a bit all around trying to 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 storm milan again that had rebelled towards the end but fading uh, anyhow coming back to germany and um got it right and in in germany he kept things under control in we made recently also a video about the rise of uh of uh, Charles of Bohemia, we have seen how the Luxembourgs were a bit kind of a papal creation, at least to 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 harass the uh, the Vittles. Actually, at this point, had in fact um, in fact helped, given protection to this great uh, theory, uh, you say radicals upon uh, radical opponents of the papacy from a theoretical point of view. In fact, there is a famous passage from from William of Ockham that said to to Ludwig like you if you defend me with a sword I will defend you with the with a pen fundamentally so that that is quite eloquent now speaking again of Marsilius the indie defensor patches the concept of political authority was developed um, with the you know the, the provision the same of a, of a full autonomy from the religious one right and the foundation of which was the people or as we were saying before better the as Marcellus said the senior and melior parts so the, the the healthier and better part of the same so it's still an oligarchy is always ruling an aristocracy if you prefer and, and and in a sense this was at the root of medieval you know, and even before in medieval world, right? Only the best rule, because they are the ones that are properly elected by God. Um, was what was evident both in paganism and in, in monotheism, right? To to do what? Yes, because paganism always had the concept of a single God, even if you know it's normally not considered, at least in the most developed. But but not even, right? You know, the celestial deity was always the same. Now. Mars and so this is important for another reason because um, Marcellus proposed furthermore that the bishops were elected by popular assemblies and that the greatest ecclesiastical authority was not the papacy but the council so you can understand why he had to flee Av Avignon quite quite quickly for that matter because of course um, this was if you want a you know primitive uh, policy of the church the idea that after all yes the, the popular assemblies were the ones deputed to to elect their own uh, the, the, the 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 clergy in a sense and so that also the primacy of the papacy that had been affirmed since the uh, gregory the seventh and the dictatus pap and so on was uh, was was a relatively new invention, and so you understand here already the the, the polemic uh, uh, re revolving around the you know the that would be resumed in in Protestant times and so on, because these are these problems had never quite been settled, right? They had been negotiated in a way, and also in the struggle between papacy and empire. But at, at the same point, at the same time, also remember that 
how can you really rule uh, Christendom if you don't have a hierarchical system, right? The rise of, of, of the Church of Rome was, was not an accident of history, right? Everything can be an accident, of course, but, you know, the primacy of Rome had been always recognized. And uh, so the, the, the consequence of this was, you know, eventually created in the papal monarchy from scratch, right, in a very innovative, unprecedented way, but still it had been instrumental to the control and the survival of the same uh, Catholicism, uh, given that uh, at some point society could really fall apart hadn't there be a control on the heresies, on different movements that were backing, uh, you know, kind of rebellious political authorities, were, by the way, emulating the papacy in literally everything, starting from the, the, the Curia, the, the Inquisition, burning at stake the repressor, the, 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 the uh, you know, the, the sin, but still with a goal that, as we've seen, was kind of localistic, and at that point without even much of a, like, why, why there should have been, uh, you know, all these different authorities within the same church, uh, or why sh there should have there not been any authority at all, right? All the instances of of papal reformation had never denied the necessity of the centrality of the of the of the Roman papacy, right? Throughout the the twelfth century, at the worst of the problem, nobody dreamt to say, okay, no, the, the pope has no doesn't exist. It's not a rule. That's kind of a hippie fantasy that we have developed in, in modern times, right? They, those were not heroes of free thinking. Were some, some are very often some of the most radically um, discriminatory and ferociously f and violently fanatic movements of, of, of the time. Because in, in the universal mindset, you see, universal mindset had always existed. So um, the before these times, right? There had ne it had never been thought that an alternative was practicable, right? In the first place, what was being debated? What were the prerogatives of the papacy and the ones of the emperor? And the same Gregorian reforms and papal monarchy had emerged because, as a reaction, by the way, to the interference uh, of of the emperor in 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 the ecclesiastical matters. And this was not lamented just by the Roman papacy. It was lamented basically by all Christendom, right, in the form of the corruption of the church, etc. So the church had to be purified by such, by such influence. And, and, and this power had fundamentally to be autonomous in that regard also from a political point of view because, you know, how can you realistic, you know, physically manage a church otherwise? Of course, these theories were saying that it was the emperor we should have provided the church with the 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 necessary material. As we will see, the same Occam had said that fundamentally, what, there is a difference between using and uh, and possessing. Right, with the church should have not possessed literally anything, and this was a debate that was emerging, in fact, among uh, among the Dominicans. And that's the reason why you also had to escape, as we will uh, had already been inquired, as we will see. But we have to be realistic. How can there be any human power without a degree of political power? Right? You know, it's impossible. Right? Every community has to have a minimum of, of a minimum of of, of control. Uh, even if, in theory, that should be done by the emperor, because at that point, who can trust can trust the emperor? Right? All the, the same gospels talk about this. Right? God is not Caesar. Right, and the church has its own complete autonomy, which was an e a deep issue, properly considering that the church possessed goods. That is to say, what was put in common by the faithful for the church administration was, you know, uh, considered as part of that of of that of, of the church itself, and so it, w it was sacred. What about the patrimonium sancti petri that had been created? as a state fundamentally, as a domination, you can say better um, that point, uh, because of the, the possessions that the church had received by the same secular authorities, by the way, that needed also to buy their own legitimization through the church. So uh, it, it's difficult to make a case for the the radical. And, and so that this is the point. We think uh, 
ah, you know, this is a democratic thing. The people should choose because we're obsessed with democracy, right? We're obsessed, especially oddly and fortunately, without any possibility of concrete um, realization of something like direct democracy that is literally the dictatorship of the totalitarianism of the people. It is somebody that normally doesn't have the competence or the capacity or the 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 comprehensive i mean the community understanding of what is going on and of course you need an elite the same mercedes was talking for for the for the for the for, for the same political authority of an elite that had to back the emperor and that that's what that was louis policy because in in germany of course they were habituated to um, essentially to 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 as german monarchs to be elected Right, and the, the the German system was hopelessly elective, so that is also something that influenced this series because, um, you know, saying the same thing in France would have been a bit more problematic at that time, considering the the dynastic monarchic and factually settled, you know, central system had was being developed there, so everything with its con within its context, right? But again, the the general criticism towards the church is. You know what? What was the church doing worse fundamentally than any other secular power at the time? On the contrary, right? The church was quite much more updated, advanced, and developed um, in fields like bureaucracy, in fields like even the, you know, important legal standards. The Inquisition was a much, much fairer tribunal than the secular ones exist in Europe all this who killed by the way for for arbitrary with arbitrary for arbitrary reasons and shady procedures much more people than the Inquisition ever did. So we have to of course set our standards for, for the times. And you couldn't but see in these theories something completely radical. Right, as we have seen also in the video about the the theorists of, of universalism, well there you have Dante that was supporting the same emperor, right? It was very critical of the church, but would, would have never dreamed to put out so such radical theories like the ones stressed by Marsilius. And help, we were talking about even just one decade later. And that tells you how Dante was anachronistic for his time in a sense, but how much, in a sense, uh, also repentine was the collapse of universal theories. Right, and you could again find parallelisms with today. Right, ten years ago there were theories now expressed politically that people would consider as lunacy, and today are considered normality. So think about these: uh, the power of the moral dimension, and the mindset, and say well, how quickly people can be convinced of different things, and that's disturbing. Or you know, also a blessing in a sense, but still, you know, hopefully for an improvement, but um, even at least was not necessarily the case. Now, speaking, and, and so, as we were also saying before, Marcellus had also theorized the, the idea that the theological reason and the political ones were divided. So again, that secular power was fundamentally an inch from any kind of theological considerations, but essentially to a pragmatic uh, logic, right, that had in this sense to limit any kind of papal interference in any political matter whatsoever. That is to say, if you wanted to be excommunicated, like Marcellus, uh, you know, if, if you know, if if the Pope excommunicated somebody, like Marcellus, by the way, <laughs> this is not, you know, anecdotal. Um, the, um, the 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 emp let's say, as we've seen, the emperor, but also the people, because that was the idea, had to. So the the secular community had to essentially have its own say in the thing and limit the the papal uh the papal action if it, it in if it wasn't seen as profitable in line with what the secular logic was and what was the secular logic you see how dangerous it is to detach the two things because if you are thinking that there is a theological um reason say and that um it's uh what what is that exactly that we will see it better in in Occam, right because he says it's pure fate right any anything else about all the aristotelian system this the the under, the, the the physical metaphysical understanding of the world is basically cannot be ever fully 
demonstrated in a sense. It's all about what you feel within, what you experience with your own senses, but you can't go too much far away with that. Um, which, in a sense, also has its own validity, because, of course, we don't know everything, we're not supposed to know everything, even what we know today scientifically, it's still miserable compared to what, what we, we, we expect, we, we think there is to know, even just by the degree of things we don't know, factually. But, again, the confidence of having some instruments that can make you arrive there by standard, because there is a... Uh, a, a general standard of truth that you you essentially live within it you just don't see because you haven't had the possibility of of unveiling it yet uh, is also a, a very important driver um, scientifically wise morally wise um, so how do you actually detach the theological uh, reason to let's say the theology as such from from politics because of course, again, we are habituated to this, right? We we take the fact that we don't uh, we don't have to impose any, but this is a much later concept that that happened at the time. These were these people were all Christian, and they they stressed the fact that of course fate was more important more important than anything else for that matter. It was they were just trying to differentiate the two things. And that's dangerous because even if politics is completely lay in nature, the question is. How can there be two different logics um, happening, uh, say, that, that people should follow at the same time, right? Uh, because, you see, even from the Gospels, fate is totalizing, right? We, we, it, the Gospels show perfectly well, I mean, there, it's not a rejection of, of the world as such. It's, it's properly stating that fate has to come first and be under consideration, and consequently, given that you live in the world, you have to consider rulers and respect them and, and, and still act, let's say, within the, what, what do you think is, is, uh, is convenient, is pragmatic, right? But first and foremost comes the reason that drives you, that is a higher reason, because of course secular authorities are faulty, whereas the truth, independently on the fact that you can get there or not, um, is always there, never fails. So if you take away that standard also from the political intention, you basically de-responsibilize the political, the government in itself, right? In fact, Marcellus had to say, yes, theology is something, uh, and while politics should be based fundamentally just on what seems to be the good in, in a, let's say, uh, if it works well, but people are live sanely, happily. And, and that's, in part, again, today, the, the idea. Even psychologists come to, to the radical idea that, you know, what important what is important is happiness, whereas we know uh, neurocognitively that this is not true, that uh, happiness is an empty pursuit. It, it's about what you can achieve and the better person that you can become that eventually makes good, right? And if you don't have a driver, if you think that all what matters is happy because it's, it's what you feel, if you, you, the meter of it is what you feel, then it's over. Because you can't find out of yourself any other reason to motivate you. And at that point, just if you are, you know, satisfied at doing nothing, uh, you, you, where, where is that people are forever happy? Or why, the, where, where's the point of arrival in somebody's life to be happy? It's not normal. Like a forever happy person is, is, is classified today with, as a, you know, with, with a neuropathology because it's not normal, right? The, the excess of, you know, bipolar disorders are, you know, person excess of, of happiness that may go insane right and and so um and also if you know th this this common good of course has to be sorted out by 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 politics still uh, what chances do we have that this is going to be satisfactory that is to say why shouldn't also political values tend to the infinite as much as as the ones of religion do and why shouldn't they overlap i mean universalism had objectively showed that it had been the, the deal since the beginning nobody could separate really uh, life and, and creation from 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 the way we have to we are provided by god to 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 control to to dispose of and that's the whole deal that's the anthropological the pretty spot on uh, anthropological and scientific and existential realization that um, we do need uh, in in every action of ours uh, 
uh, a a high an idea of higher of higher good, right, or something that you know is is you know that that may, can give us the the possibility of going beyond our beyond our, to reach beyond ourselves, uh, and the and realizing also the unavoidable fault that uh, the 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 world i mean the uh, uh, human nature has within the sin so how can you expect from from just a secular authority to to make the work without any further model that inf that informs its own action because that's the problem here they weren't denying that there was uh, a god or and and all what derived from it they were trying to to separate that from politics in a as if people acted for no reason in their in their in their mind and, and god is, is here a broader existential philosophical scientific acknowledgement it's not you know the need of an alter ego of the emperor detached especially from from its own function it doesn't make any sense right um so william of ockham 1280 1349 english by birth was um, you know, he entered very, very young in the Fran Francisca, Franciscan order. Um, and from 1307, before I, I talk about the Dominicans, that was a mistake. 1307 in, uh, to 1318, he studied at the University of Oxford, where he eventually taught as well. And in 1324, he went to Avignon to Pope John uh, XXII again. Uh, where he remained uh, for four years while a commission of theologians was checking essentially some aspect of, of his works that had been judged in England as incongruent with orthodoxy. And it was in fact at Avignon that William met with mm, Michael from Cesena that was the um, general minister of the order of Franciscans who shared his idea that was opposed by the Pope that to the Christian communities could be uh, granted the use but in in any case the property of goods um, and since William and his uh, Franciscan brothers feared the reaction of the Pope in front of their choices in May 1328 they fled to Avignon and they uh, repaired to Pisa, uh, as we were saying before, while uh, the Emperor Ludwig of Bavarian was there. And there, in fact, they were reached by excommunication as well. And it was also for this reason that William followed the Emperor to Germany, where he remained uh, up to his death. So th the, the matter of the uh, of property of the Franciscans was a big deal since the beginning of the foundation of the order. You know, the, the Dominicans had been created with a much more almost military like um and but at the same time intellectual bias right you know of a very stern orderly organization uh, created specifically with with a very high educational standard to counter the the catters in southern france uh, uh, shortly afterwards saint francis had founded the franciscan order received the permission from the pa uh, papacy to preach but you know franciscans at least a fringe of them including the saint francis originally had always remained borderline in terms of of orthodoxy um and uh, a big deal of the the order was as we know poverty right and so th there had been within the saint franciscans this great debate um, whether the Franciscans should, should be just mendicant friars, fundamentally, literally living in the open, uh, just served by, you know, the, the pious souls who would give, you know, food and shelter to them, or whether they had to actually organize, uh, you know, they should own some possessions in order to, of course, you know, what, again, the radical idea, of living like that but practically especially when the order started becoming larger how do you organize any community without a political power any property in the first place so as you know the franciscans were eventually disciplined by the pope to to become essentially a copy of the dominicans so owning property having a specific discipline lifestyle uh sanitary lifestyle and so on and aligning 
in that direction. So uh, some Franciscans, including here the, uh, the, the the William and Michael of Cesena, that was even the you know the master of of the order, uh, the general minister of the order, uh, you know, uh, thought still otherwise. So even think about from the papal perspective, right? How you know how can you even control the orthodoxy of an order that doesn't have a fixed um, you know, doesn't have property, which means either depends on, on some private person that maybe has interest to, to weaponize them, or literally that roams around, it doesn't have, they're not trackable, they're not accountable, right? How is it that even possible? In any case, this was a broader polemic that was moved to the church, generally speaking, to the, this enormous, of course, power and and splendor and, and material wealth that the, 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 that it had at that point. The papacy, again, had armies of the count, you know, operating constantly in, uh, in, in many situations with tens of thousands of, of troops, soldiers, um, prostitutes. Uh, the, the, the various legates wanted to create some uh, signories on, on private signories on their own. Uh, stripping some some powers of their secular powers of their their authority and settling in their place. So it was a moment, like if you wonder why this this tension existed, why well, it was obviously for political reasons. That is why the the see, see if you if you if you are against the papacy as any other power at that point, um, you can say for them if you want to weaken their power, but you're just the, the papacy. You should think just about spiritual matters. Why do you have armies? It's very easy to make that point. The question is also in practice, what are you going to do about that? And that ha had been consistently the case, as we've seen, even in the struggle against the Hohenstaufen, against Frederick II, and the crusade against Manfred, the arrival of Charles of Anjou. There were always secular authorities that would also side with the papacy for that matter. In this case, the, the king of France also. So, um, it's it's um, this does intertwine deeply with the uh, the philosophical achievements of William, that was a great thinker and scholar. There is no doubt about this, but always remember that it's rooted in this context, so not an unbiased context. And so, something that even in the philosophical inclination obviously takes a certain orientation. I mean, what William of Ockham says, again, as we were saying in the beginning, follows a pattern that is kind of ideological in nature. Like any other thought that you can't find story. There was a reason why the the church had organized, reorganized its philosophy, shifting from Neoplatonism and asceticism to to, to, to essentially realism, rationalism, and, you know, scientific uh, orientation it was actually an enormous civilizational step forward for a universe for, for a power whichever it was but even more remarkable considering that he had a, a universal scope and that still uh, that system held for a long time because ob objectively it was functional to the world he had been created for so as author of political texts Occam opposed himself both to the Eurotic thesis that had been dear to Boniface VIII, that were objectively the most, uh, you know, the, the boldest that the, the the papacy had produced. That is essentially the idea of literally a, a eurocracy slash theocracy in in the world. So that you know the 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 will of of, of emperors and kings had to be subjected to the will of the of the pope. Um, even there, we could speculate, but. Uh, Still, they were there were specific times in history where you have to understand again where that came from and why, and also the completely lay ones of Marcellus of Padua himself that uh, wished for a church essentially subjective to the prince. Oh, that's interesting because Marcellus' thought uh, was again essentially the Roman one. Right, the idea of the emperor ruling all over the universe and therefore everybody needing to obey to him. These theories at that point were pretty much in vogue uh, among uh, even the, the, the greatest jurists in medieval Europe. Right, Bartolo from Sassoferrato at that point that basically uh, 
set the standards for for the Roman law uh, interpretation Europe wide essentially shared this 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 idea and so that was quite impact and quite polemical in, in nature and, and naturally there was from the side of the secular authority a, a pro civil law Roman law bias right for obvious reasons again uh, the Bolognese school had been endowed with privileges and rights by Frederick Barbarossa as soon as he descended in the Italian peninsula immediately and then that that triggered uh, you know that was f functional to his own policy of recovery of you know, imperial prerogatives over the, the papacy and that that's why the struggle between papacy and emperor had always kind of been inflated because uh, they were both trying to maintain their own independence they were constantly you know, and reciprocally influencing each other but according to Ockham, between religious and civil authority, the distinction had to be clear, right? Uh, since the different aims pertain to each of them. In the same way, according to Ockham, it was necessary to distinguish between faith and reason. So he exercises the split, right? From one side, no revealed truth could be object of scientific demonstration i mean no one that is to say properly the, uh, th this is important because all the scriptures fundamentally were saying things that couldn't quite be scientifically demonstrated and this was a huge problem given that aristotelianism i mean the, the thomism with aristotle had made this enormous work to 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 make the two things fit in this incredible mechanism and on the other hand no um, the, the, say philosophy was founded on the orderly use of reason and on the empirical demonstration that could not in any way be influenced by faith um, which is it's naturally an important scientific realization even though uh, Occam was famous also for his own intuition and somebody would say that intuition at that point comes from something that goes beyond the mere um, empirical and uh, let's say the, the mere, re mere reason first of all and empirical evidence that is to say uh, religion in that sense puts you in front of some patterns that objectively are useful to interpret a reality and we know this now right studying the bible in a scientific key that you know there are very very obvious scientific anthropological and you know uh, broader natural uh, acquisitions that are correct substantially and they are metaphorical allegorical but they, they do fit things that the world had known right since the traditional cultures had already observed reasoned and we don't have to think that you know uh, the two we, we are exchanging the tool of science for the end or the motivation which is another thing and without which the tool itself is useless albeit still you know fueling the process of course and for the same reason for which it had been developed but in that sense also uh, the Thomism had been you know, it had been important because it, it gave essentially a, the the confidence of mankind to 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 be able to perscrutate the the world creation. Naturally, as in the moment in which had become dogma, well, the thing was was putting some boundaries that was from the side of the papacy to say, okay, nobody can context this anymore. This is just you know perfection point end of the story you can't go against it because otherwise you're going against fate well Occam was objectively stating something that was said more realistic in a cognitive sense that is to say it all starts from us essence and existence outside of, of the individual soul which uh, uh, so for which the natural world is just fundamentally what is perceived by uh, you know by that individual nothing else right this is also important neurocognitively right but he stated essentially the substance and accident in, in that regard were fundamentally the same thing just like essence and existence uh, fundamentally were <laughs>
But she's a bright thought. The problem is, where do we go from here? That once the soul has acquired that that knowledge, how does it share and how does it build knowledge at that point? And along which which presumption of of objectivity that has to share with others. It's not a scientific problem. It's a political one. And that's what they were denying, in fact. You know, the fact that the, the, the church could have any of that kind of uh, interference on, on this. Whereas science and politics, science meant as, as not the tool, but as the, the sum of knowledge and eventually how you the use you make of the same are fundamentally the same thing. Now, among the f most important philosophical works of William of Ockham, we remember the commentary on the sentences of, of Peter Lombard and the Summa Logite that founded in Western philosophy uh, a new method, an alternative method, fundamentally, in, uh, compared to the mystics, to um, receive and using Aristotle philosophy. But the work that provided the greater help to Louis the Fort's thesis was the Dialogus, in which William um, stated that imperial authority derived from God, not by mean of the Pope, but the one of men. Mm -hmm. So you understand what that is going from. It's about the individual responsibility, but there is no superior authority in between man and God. As such, you're fundamentally denying the the sacred uh, role of, of priesthood as a medium that is that had existed fundamentally in every in every culture up to that point. Because without certain uh, specific moral standards, divine. Um, d divine uh, truth could not be approached fundamentally um, and um, and therefore this was a way of saying uh, in previous times that of course not everybody can arbitrarily set its its own moral state its own morality per se right this does happen empirically in fact but it doesn't happen when it clashes with you know, a theory that actually works and that you can criticize and that you can come to to um, to even debunk, but only if you actually have the capacity to do it. So pretending that every individual has this capacity is wishful thinking and therefore you should still obey to an authority. It doesn't matter how approximate this is, but still it's the standard you should look at in that regard. And, and the church had naturally monopolized that prerogative in their own view. Um, the need of, of the sacred in this regard is the one of projecting yourself towards the infinity, right? So if you don't set, if you start setting certain standards by yourself, you will, most people will not pressure themselves as much as, you know, the best can do. Right, so Marsilius, in a, in a sense, even speaking of a popular approach, had stressed this. I mean, the fact that it was an aristocracy, in any sense, that had still to that had a greater weight, and that's kind of a more realistic, uh, I mean, less ideal um, view of the world. That of course the elites rule because they're uh, they are elite for a reason, um, and um, furthermore. Uh, Ockham said the emperor was yes superior to the laws think about it importantly but still um, under natural equity that is he could not uh, issue orders that were harmful to the people and when he would have done it it became licit to disobey him right and the, uh, the the idea here is is also interesting because Marcellus had envisaged and said like uh, he, he had said yes that the secular authority had been essentially coercive in nature 
this is a very uh, kind of realpolitik uh, understanding of it. That is, uh, the the emperor was just the the, the armed arm, let's say. Um, whereas the church had 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 this persuasive power, right? So of course this was say re turned to to all the community of the faithful because everybody lived in the church at the time. But at the same time, just certain individuals were, you know, more more capable of maintaining those standards to influence each other. Whereas for for Alcam, there was kind of a you know general equity that um, could at that point be spotted by the people altogether. Um, so the delegation of the authority of the Roman people to the emperor was thus conditioned by his own good government. It was not absolute, which is also realistic in nature, because it, it, there can't be just a purely coercive power. How do you get that? It's pure force. Now, even you know, uh, von Clausewitz's absolute war can can reach that uh, idea. But in, in spite of this, all in, when we look at Marcellus of Padua and William of Ockham, we are in the front of the foundation, essentially, of statal power modernly intended. That is to say, properly disjointed from from any uh, theological consideration. Right? So, from, from any possibility of interference of a uh, you know, standard of mm, let's say, of, of, of religious uh, recognition that uh, by, uh, up to that point had been a universal necessity and that here instead says you know it, it's something that simply goes beyond in any power at this point because in the moment in which you trigger equity there you realize that imperial power is not full or even when of course the uh, uh, you know in previous times everybody realized that imperial power was limited this was seen as a essentially a projection of divine will um, in, and, um, and thus somewhat connected to what the church was admonishing to um, uh, as far as things were going you know, worse or, or well, things could go better for, for that matter as well. Of course, it was a, a degree on imperscrutability in that regard, but still it was connected and dependent on papal and Papal say, right? Said at this point, he says, no, we decide essentially whatever we want independently from anybody. Uh, and that's also not kind of a very realistic uh, idea because, you see, until Westphalia, the, the idea of, of, of a sovereign state was completely sovereign within its own boundaries was not even properly uh, accepted, nor it, it's ever been realistic, even afterwards, to, to presume. Right? It was just an effort to declare, essentially, a, a greater govern the possibility of a greater governability by getting rid of these international figures who were declining in, 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 uh, in, uh, in authoritativeness, and that therefore could be targeted and humiliated and saying, you know, you, you don't have any any power whatsoever at this point, and so let's just be it. But this didn't quite solve the problems of of uh, of the broader world understanding. At that point, was kind of being given up, right? Because which other power could have also put together something against the, um, you know, like against sch scholastics? Right, you could have these individual uh, scholars, such as Occam, etc., that could criticize parts of it, but there was no power up to that point that had the means to, or the reason, uh, to, like to to substitute scholastics as it was taught in universities, um, by w with something else. Right, the juridical studies had made that part, and uh, were trying to to push on for these new ideas at, at the end of the day, but. Um, the way this this law was obeyed or not didn't depend much on the ideal, right? It depended on the balance of power that was being formed at the time. So again, there were other powers that 
uh, other problems that these powers were dealing with um, that were were aimed at restructuring power from 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 the ground right um, after the failure of the great universal enterprises that were simply uh, a paradigm paradigm shift uh, from you know two different civilizational stages the ones of the rise the one of of, of the contraction and that are understandable in, in this regard as eventually later on this this powers would be so cohesive that there wouldn't be any way as we were saying before to create a new overlordship and some kind of universal value per se but still the tendency of civilization in a sense is that one so in any expansional phase you will find kind of a universal necessity of 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 of, of, of order in an overruling sense right properly stressing the, the necessity of an homogeneity if anything for for uh, governance reasons right you you can't have order without that and when things fragment and divide it, of course these powers are going to say their own thing their own way that, and so in their own peculiar um peculiar um uh, you know with the peculiar traits characters uh, characteristics etc um in any case we will keep talking about these things some point for now however we stop it here just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye